Okay, I think we should be good to go. Um, this patient is a 67 year old gentleman. Um, I follow at one of our outlying clinics. Um, see, been seeing him for a couple of years and saw his wife last in June, I guess. Who said, Did my husband ever tell you he had hepatitis C? <laughs> so uh, that started the discussion. Um, he was never treated, had no follow up testing until, you know, this month. He has retired from um, working on oil rigs down in the Gulf of Mexico. He I think originally from Alabama or somewhere. He's disabled <laughs> lung disease, so he had retired early on disability. Um, he's had recurrent DVTs. He has a filter, um, COPD, um, hypertension, BPH, back pain, sort of the usual suspects. The interesting wrinkle for me with this case is going to be that he has no um, Medicare D plan. Uh, he is, so we're not, I got to figure out uh, with help from you guys how to get treatment paid for if we decide to treat him. Um, but he's, uh, you see his list of medications there. He is anticoagulated, which is another interesting question to me. Um, he used, he was coming in for years with what we were treating as exacerbations of his COPD. And then I started diving into his history a bit and found out he had a filter and was having, um, we were concerned that he was having recurrent DVTs. So actually we put him on, he humored me by taking a month of an anticoagulant and he didn't have any exacerbations during that time. So I guess he was showering little clots. Uh, <laughs> but anyway. Um, you can see his height and weight. His BMI is not outlandish. I mean, he looks like a healthy looking guy you see him walking down the street. Labs were done last month. Uh, WBC count is normal, as this is A&C. Hemoglobin, hematocrit, pretty good. Platelet count's normal. Kidney function is normal. Sugar is normal. Um, liver functions are really not out. Um, iron studies and everything look pretty good. Um, <laughs> took till like this week to find out his genotype. We kept having issues with the lab orders, but he is genotype 1A. His viral load is um, let's see, can we go on down to that actually? Uh, okay. All right. I need to get his viral load um, because that was one of the things we had trouble getting. <laughs> so let me, uh, Find that he's at like four million eighty eight four million eight hundred thousand essentially is his viral load. Um, so the question is, I mean, he's probably had this for forty years or so. He's a little cagey about whether he ever used um, IV drugs. He said he used to hang out with people who did. Um, he is not immune to hep A or hep B. We did finally get that information as well. So we'll go ahead and get those immunizations started uh, while we're figuring out what to do about whether to treat him. Um, he has not had any um, imaging of his liver. And I guess that's another question since this is probably something that's gone on for 40 years uh, needing to start that. So, um, and you know, he's on the PPI. I think we could, probably uh, stop that for a while. His reflux symptoms have never been real prominent. So I guess I just need some guidance on what to do with this gentleman. Excellent, thank you. Um, any thoughts, feedback, recommendation for Dr. Rexford? Dr. Rexford, this is John. Um, what, what uh, was the anticoagulation that the patient's on? Is it warfarin? Uh, it's Eliquis. Oh, okay. This is Brace Kaylee. Me. Oh, go ahead, John. I was gonna. I... No, I wasn't sure if Rachel or anybody had already done the drug interaction. Go ahead and finish, and then I'll jump in. Yeah. So I looked. I looked through them. Um, well, a couple of things, Doctor Rexford. Um, thank you so much for the case. I. Uh, I would recommend liver imaging for him just exactly the reasons that you said. He's had this for 40 
plus years, who knows how long, and he's almost 70, so I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, his APRI, I mean, you know, I didn't have the normal ranges, but if you look at his platelets and then his AST value, I mean, it's 16, so we can assume his APRI would be well within normal, no concerns for um, cirrhosis from that standpoint. But um, if you do a write-up of quadrant on him, I may just consider getting a fibro test as well, um, just purely for the sake of you just want to get as much information as you can to see if maybe he even has stage three disease and would still need um, HCC surveillance screens. But, um, you know, other than that, I think, you know, as far as treatment options, if we're just considering genotype one, and I'm sorry if you guys, I have a lot of feedback, so if you guys can't hear me, just cut me off and I'll, I, I might end up calling in. But, uh, uh, you know, your four treatment options are going to be Navarit, Epclusa, Harvoni, or Zepatier. Um, you know, we really don't use Zepatier too much anymore because you have to get that all testing we'll just say you have the the magic three um as you said dr rexford you know you can technically hold his omeprazole um you may not not need to but you have uh maverick as an option as well, and so i i all and and choose a hep c agent that's not going to interact with that such as the maverick now his um uh eloquist it actually, there's nothing, there's not any contraindications with these agents, just understand you have to monitor more closely for episodes of bleeding. Um, and so just gonna consider that too, is let the patient know um, if he has any other medications, uh, I don't see any on the list but that have um, any kind of strong CYP3, 4 um, inducers, then he you know, may need to decrease that, that dose, but he's already on a pretty low dose anyway. So. Um, yeah. I would just monitor him for, for bleeding, but nothing that you'd need to stop, or hold, or reduce for the time being with any of those agents. Okay. Um, but, you know, Maverick for eight weeks seems to be pretty reasonable for him. Um, you could also do a Clusa or Harvoni as well, but just a little bit um, longer course and would, would have to consider that omeprazole, as you suggested. Did I miss anything? I think I think I answered the questions you had. Sorry, I muted myself again to cut out the noise. <laughs> Kaylee, I really like your point of still obtaining fibrosis markers just to make sure. We, we know he's not cirrhotic, but um, there is consequence of having F3 uh, on, on biomarkers or elastography with regard to needing long-term HCC screening and the Beautifully said, I agree with you. Probably get some liver imaging of some form and the fibrosis markers. Okay. Well, give it a try. <laughs> Rachel, did you have a comment as well? So you had unmuted or all um, Kaylee hit all the nails on the head already with um, drug interaction from, from, from that standpoint. Um, the only other thing I didn't see on here was hepatitis B to look for reactivation with the DAAs. I don't know if he's been tested or vaccinated. Um, he has he has been tested. He is negative. Um, and I was thinking that we would go ahead and get his immunization started. It's been like pulling teeth to get the information on this guy. Some of the lab orders got lost and, and that sort of thing. So um, now that I have the information, uh, we do plan to immunize him for a and B. Hey, hey, Rachel, this okay. is Kaylee. Um, I just had a question for you. Since he doesn't have per D coverage, is there anything you feel like would be a little bit more feasible for him to start uh, one agent versus yeah. the other? Well, to be honest with you, and that was going to be kind of my next, my next thing here is that with, if he truly has no prescription coverage he'd be a good candidate at least to try to pursue um, assistance from the manufacturer to get free drug uh, which if he would be approved they would supply directly to them so um, that's not something that we do here that's usually something that the social workers do in the clinics because that requires tax documentation to, to do um, like proof of income because these manufacturer programs um, we usually review these on a case-by-case -case basis and I've I've definitely seen patients where they've approved them that have, you know, decent incomes, 
where I was surprised because I thought, well, this person's, you know, not X percent of the poverty level, so they're not going to give them free drug, but they will. Um, and something else to consider um, possibly too would be the generics that come for both Harvoni, uh, that are available for Harvoni and Epclusa. Um, they, they're usually pretty good. We use them for our Medicare patients, but generally those are the patients that have a Part D plan, so that we'll cover some of it. So there is foundation assistance. Remember, that's different than the manufacturer assistance. Um, and that foundation assistance will um, also provide funds for patients. And a lot of times we can use those to cover part of the cost of these expensive medications. Um, but just, just knowing what the cash price for these are, the foundation assistance wouldn't cover the full treatment. So we'd have to have another option um, to make sure they got a full, um, full course of the treatment based on the cost. But I don't know if you have like a social worker or somebody that could help try to collect those tax doc documents. Um, a lot of the information for the manufacturer programs are available online. You can just go to their website and start that process um, and submit all of that. Usually that, you know, they have to have like a valid order and, and everything has to, would have to be signed by both you and the patient. Um, but um, that's definitely an option for you as far as getting that started to see if the free drug could, could be supplied by them. And I don't, I've never seen where it's, it's, uh, it's been easier to do like Maverick versus um, which is through AbV versus um, Harvoni or Epclusa through Gilead Support Path. They both seem to be kind of kind of equal, um, and I, I wouldn't limit it based on that because you know if one of them denies, try the other and see if they would approve it. Hey Carmen, how's he how's he getting his other medicines now? Because like Epclusa's or Epclusa, um, um, Eliquis is really expensive. Like, is he doing it like through your 340B program, or is it like does he? I mean, he might be even dual eligible, like to get Medicaid on top of his Medicare too. Um, I think he, we're actually doing the manufacturer's process for the Eliquis. Um, but I will double check on that. I know he gets the other things through the 340B. I also got a chat in saying payments.org has helped some patients with coverage at lower costs as well. Thank you, Donna. Hey guys, this is Louie at Allied. If, if he is a Medicaid patient, they won't allow him to use the 340B uh, product because it's, they look at that as a duplicate discount. But for Rachel, what Rachel was saying, um, uh, he has as good a chance as anyone else to get access through the free drug program. The only problem with that is we, we just can't, we don't get to follow them or dispense the drug when they do that because they tie our hands and don't allow us to do that. Okay. Well, we'll probably pursue the company route because we've got somebody here who's kind of a wizard at that kind of thing. So, Awesome. Excellent. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Dr. Rexro, did that answer everything for you as well? Did you have any other follow-up questions? I think we're good. I think I know where to go now. So <laughs> thank you. That's excellent. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, and Dr. Peters, I know you had a case question. I'll turn things over to you to ask that and everything. Yeah, ho hopefully just real quick. I, I have a guy who back in 2017 um, had uh, the chronic hepatitis C. He and I, I had actually presented him and his wife at the same time. Both had hep C, um, both genotype 1, um, both treated with 12 weeks of Harboni. Um, she achieved SVR and he did not. And we were looking maybe to pursue treating him uh, again. At that time, uh, back in 2017, so back in 20, I'm sorry, I said 2017, I think it was 2018. Let me double check. 20. Yeah, it was 20, back in 2017. So in 2017, um, he he came up as an F2. And then, you know, about a year later was, an, it was gauged as an F3 to four. And now his fibros, his, his fiber shirt comes back as an F4. And I don't have good reason for that. Um, and he's not a patient of mine. He actually is, is one of the folks that I've treated, um, that that lives out in uh, in in Pocahontas County, a very rural area. 
so what we did was when his when this came back as an f4 he's never had any signs of decompensation or or, or any reason for us to think that he has um hepatic disease that is as severe he's not coagulopathic his ast and his alt are normal um, but his fiber shirt comes back as an f4 we imaged his liver and it's nor it looks normal he has never had elastography um, just mostly because of where he lives so it's uh, it, it's very difficult for him to get there um, i guess my question is sort of twofold. So the first is, is that really the next step is doing something like elastography to get to, to better kind of characterize the severity of his fibrosis and cirrhosis. Um, is, is that really the next step or with an ultrasound, with a plain ultrasound of normal size and echogenicity, is that sufficient to, I guess, do what we the opposite of what we normally do, which is to kind of say, well, okay, this, the, you know, the indirect testing is probably overestimating this guy's severity of, 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 of his hepatic dysfunction and instead pursue something like Vosevi, which as I understand it would be the salvage regimen in him probably for 12 weeks. And again, he's got, I guess if he has cirrhosis, it would still be the salvage regimen for him. And since he has no history of decompensation, it would probably be safe to do so. It, everything else on this guy's clear. He takes no medicines, right? So like he's, he's really a healthy guy other than this hep C, which I would love to cure for him. So if that, if that makes it, if, if any of that didn't make sense, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll clarify. Thanks, Greg. I think um, really well thought out. I think you already kind of answered some of your own questions. Um, I mean, do you, what was his genotype? Do you remember? Yep. It's 1A. It was 1A. And then what, what he was treated with Epclusa or what did you say he was treated with? Har Harvoni, Harvoni for 12. He was an F2 when we did that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Times 12. Cause I'm wondering, um, you know, since he failed Harvoni, did he i remember him pretty clearly because i remember you bringing up how his wife achieved svr and he didn't and we kind of talked about man he's in that stinking one yeah, exactly it was, it was kind of cool because they both had like it was almost cute like we were gonna like treat their hep c yeah and, yeah that's always and, exciting and until it's not <laughs> so, same like the time say you know the whole thing yeah. and then um like is always the case he his wife was better at it than he was i guess i don't know like i hate to you know but, but it, it you know i feel and he's bum i mean he's kind of bummed out about it and he's sure. not a mind that i follow closely but um i would uh, you know but yeah so, so i mean i'll answer that in two prong first um in regards to his fibrosis um you know, if his ultrasound is normal, think of it with the natural history, since he already had established fibrosis, once it's there, it can really progress at variable rates. So, I mean, he could very easily be stage three, stage four, um, even this amount. I would look at is with the fibro test, try to look at the individual um, markers and see if any of them are, are pretty out of range. So if his ALT was, you know, significantly high, sometimes the alpha-2 macroglobulins will be high. It can really fudge that number up. Um, but if his ultrasound is, is normal, you know, I don't think it would make a difference really at this point to... Um, try to pursue a, an elastography. You could try to do the APRI, calculate that. But for now, I probably would go ahead and continue um, just HCC surveillance screens every six months um, since he kind of already was F3 to F4 and now F4. So um, that concept would still be there. As far as management, I wouldn't, um, you know, you, your treatment options are going to be this as retreatment. Now he's probably going to have difficulty it, it's not going to be easy for them to just say hey okay this guy failed let's let's treat him with Fosevi. um you can always try but you'll probably have to do um the ns5a resistance testing just to show that you know he was resistant to um the lodiposphere and that's why it didn't work so Vosevi would still be your regimen but they, they're probably not going to be as accommodating as approving this um so he'll probably, is, is, if, if I understood you correctly, so he'll probably need the NS5A. Probably. I mean, I, I would go ahead and submit him um, and just see what their response is. But, but you know, I've submitted very few for those.
just here have as well. And both times they've really said we have to, we've had trouble. They, they don't um, want to consider it a treatment failure unless you have proof. And so I would, um, you know, so I guess, I guess the, so, like if, so if we do that and it comes back negative, it's still Vosevi, right? It's still Vosevi. It's just that they may, may or may not. Um, I just want to make sure I wasn't. Pay being, for it. About okay, got it. Yeah. So, no, so, it's just and, that they'll want to say, well, why didn't he? And I mean, you can justify it as well. He fell in that small proportion. Um, but, you know, I would go ahead and try to submit him. Just understand you're probably going to have to still get the. Um, follow-up resistance that polymorphism test okay and yeah and i looked at it while just uh while, while you were talking there his his alpha uh to macro is is hot it's really okay. hot um everything else is actually really good i mean all, yeah, the, all good. i mean i would maybe look back at the sequential ones that you've done and just see if maybe that number isolated has been increasing and but you know he he probably doesn't have cirrhosis but i would still kind of treat him as advanced fibrosis as such since you have a few biomarkers um and that's still 12 weeks right i mean those heavy 12 weeks yeah yeah okay yep great that's what we'll do then thanks man appreciate it mm -hmm. awesome any other thoughts for dr peters that was super interesting you guys <laughs> thank you that was a lot <laughs> <laughs> Remember, if you if you want to look at, there's a really nice section on treatment experience patients on hcvguidelines.org. Um, so it's certainly nothing you have to memorize. It walks you through nicely patients who have uh, had treatment failures, even though they're obviously very small um, with various regimens. And they, just like Greg and Kaylee were discussing, in some situations, there's different lengths of therapy depending upon the agent, um, depending if the patient's cirrhotic or not. So in this scenario, it doesn't seem to play a big role. But um, hey, Greg, we, we um, don't uh, see a lot of patients who go untreated or poor or like uh, non-response. Um, but you know, this is the progression of fibrosis was the, the usual that we would watch in the interferon days when we didn't treat anybody. You know, when, when you only treated one out of 10 people, um, seeing fibrosis progress, and it can do this nonlinear jumping around type stuff. Um, and uh, so it's cool that you presented that one. Thank you, man. Sure. Just real quick, was that true back when, like, for non invasive, like, would you see that in biopsies too? Like, where it's nonlinear, like, where they would jump around with the, I mean, did you do biopsies frequently then? I don't, no. I don't no. So the, the biopsies, about you know the most i think we ever re repeated i know one guy who had two um the the uh inconvenience pain etc uh usually usually uh scared people away but the, the rule of thumb was about every five to seven years to repeat one um unless prompted by clinical um indications but you know the biomarkers have certainly supplanted the the need to do the invasive testing um, but yeah, but you, you you nicely demonstrate what our fear is in uh, clinical monitoring is you can have sort of rapid progression and you remember the factors at play there can be viral such as uh, co-infections HIV so I, I have seen an HIV positive patient on biomarkers um, progress in about two years um, from early disease to what consistently um, shows up as F4. And that's kind of mind blowing. I, I don't buy it 100%, but um, the uh, we know his exact time of acquisition, and it was not a very long um, course. But you know, there's all stuff written on on rapidity of progression with immunocompromised patients and those with other comorbidities that affect the liver. Um, and then the old adage that fibrosis begets fibrosis. So uh, once you start, it can speed up. All right, great. Um, so if there are no other comments or thoughts or questions, I want to leave some time for Kaylee's didactic as well. So um, Kaylee, did you want to pull it up and advance the slides or should I pull it up for you and do that? Um, I, whichever you prefer. Go ahead and do it because by the time I get it pulled up, it'll be over. <laughs> so I'd rather you just do it. Okay. No I, if, you, if you can, I mean, I can always share or uh, forward the slides. I just 
Okay, yeah, no worries. Whichever you prefer, you can always just say next slide and I'll do that as well. Okay. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about HIV pre-exposure, pre uh, prophylaxis or PrEP. I gave a didactic on this about a year ago, but um, there have been some updates, so we'll kind of focus on those a little bit, um, but this is more of a refresher, so if there's time... I'm so sorry, Kaylee. Can you hear me? I can hear you, hear you fine, but I hear an audio in the background as well. So do, so do I, and I don't know where it's coming from. No, where it's coming from either. I really apologize. Let me uh, see. Um, yeah, see. it, it says my bandwidth is low. So oh. I, let's see. I'm so sorry to cut you off. But if anything, I can always just call in and, and do it if it's on my end. Let's see. It says it's opening back up. Um, let me try to share it one more time. Okay. Are you able to see that okay? Mm hmm Yes. Okay. I see that. Oh, here's an audio. I think the audio was playing like this. Let's see. Okay. Let's try this one more time. All okay. right. Okay. It, is that better? So I may have to keep it like this. Is that okay with everyone? I think there's an audio playing back when I create like a full slide screen. Um, can everyone see this one okay? I'll advance the slides this way. Seems yeah. fine. Okay, perfect. I'm so sorry about that, Kaylee. Thank you. Hey, no worries. Is it, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So um, what I was starting to say, so this is kind of an HIV prep uh, refresher. I'm going to add a couple of things in um, from my last talk because since there have been some updates, but if you guys have any questions at the end, because I'm going to breeze over some things that we may have already covered last year, um, and I know there are some new listeners, so we can always revisit those too if I need to clarify further. Um, go ahead and advance to the next slide. So objectives today are to summarize the data related to PrEP use, identify who's going to benefit from PrEP, and then discuss the clinical aspects of prescribing PrEP. Next slide. So this is just a graph, um, a graph of HIV prevalence. Um, so those living with HIV uh, in the U.S. This is from 2016. Um, 2018, I couldn't find anything as pretty as this, but it's about 1.2 million right now. So not significantly, or too, too significantly different from uh, 2016. And um, next slide shows the incidence of new infections. So about 38,700 um, new HIV infections diagnosed in 2016. Uh, 2018, the most current data er, that was released that I can find anyway, um, it's still about 38,000 um, new infections diagnosed per year. And next slide. So in West Virginia, Um, we have our populations about 1.8 million, and so overall we have a, a pretty low prevalence of HIV or those individuals living with HIV in West Virginia. We have less than about less than 2,000 um, individuals living with HIV, and this is again data from 2016. Now, interestingly, um, 2018, 2019, we saw a big uptick in cases in Cabell. Uh, county, if you guys remember the health advisories and all the news um, press from that, but um, Cabell County, which is kind of lower east, if you can um, see where it's at, District 2, um, they usually have on average about uh, an incidence of eight cases a year, and um, in 2019, they had closer to 70 cases um, that year, and, and many were related to injection drug drug use. So Kanawha County is up there too in a higher incidence as well. Um, certainly nothing like Cabell, but um, still averaging uh, uh, kind of our highest HIV rates of new diagnoses. Next uh, slide, please. So these are, um, this is a, a list of new HIV diagnoses that were linked to injection drug use. And linked means that either the HIV diagnosis, the individual um, identified the risk as either IDU, um, may have been MSM and IDU, or they may have not disclosed injection drug use as a risk, but the case that they were linked back to, their risk factor was IDU. So if you can see in Cabell County, um, 92 individuals 
who list HIV infection from 2018 to 2020, kind of the next um, 29 cases. And then from there down, you can see um, kind of after the, the top six, um, there are a bunch of asterisks and those numbers were protected because there were only one to four HIV diagnoses in those counties. But you can clearly see, um, you know, even though overall in the US HIV is actually decreasing um, about 7% over the last several years um, in West Virginia, our numbers of uh, HIV positive individuals that are diagnosed uh, with a risk of injection drug use is actually increasing. So that's why we're talking about PrEP. Next slide. Um, so what is PrEP? It's basically um, the concept I relate it to, to patients is it's uh, similar to the concept of birth control. So where birth control, the Ideas to prevent pregnancy, PrEP is ideas to prevent HIV infection. And so it's not 100%, um, but it is one measure to help reduce the risk. This is for HIV negative individuals who are at a higher risk of HIV infection. And the concept is that they take an antiretroviral medication before they have a potential exposure. Um, PrEP is not indicated for patients that do not know their HIV status or have a positive HIV status. Um, in 2012, the FDA approved Truvada, which is the co-formulation of emtricitabine and tenofovir disaproxyl, um, to be taken once a day for PrEP in adults. It was actually approved for HIV treatment, I think around 2004, so already being used as an HIV uh, treatment regimen or partial treatment regimen, but in 2012 was when FDA said it was cool to use it for PrEP. So, um, 2019, so this is new, but in October of 2019, the FDA approved Discovi for PrEP. And so Discovi is um, similar to Truvada. It's the same um, co-formulation as far as emtricitabine and then a tenofovir, but it's the pro-drug of tenofovir, um, which is tenofovir alafanamide. It's still taken once a day. Um, as HIV treatment, this medication um, has shown that there's improved um, renal protection um, and less bone toxicity than with the Truvada co-formulation. Um, and so this was approved as an alternative PrEP regimen uh, late last year. Um, the two things I want to note, and I'll, I'll kind of reiterate this multiple times, but um, the big thing to worry about with PrEP is renal toxicity or the potential for renal toxicity. Truvada is approved um, for those individuals that have a creatinine clearance greater than 60 mLs a minute, Discovi, it's a little, little lower, so you have more forgiveness, so it's approved for individuals with a creatinine clearance greater than 30. Next slide. Um, so in 2014, the DHHS and CDC established PrEP clinical practice guidelines, um, and this is listed as a one as one prevention option for sexually active men who have sex with and adult persons who inject drugs who are at substantial risk of HIV acquisition. They updated these guidelines in 2017. Um, the 2017 guidelines were published in 2018. Um, at some point, we will see new um, updates as well. PrEP is now approved, so Discovi is not yet um, in the guidelines, even though it's FDA approved as PrEP. And then the other thing to note is that um, PrEP is also now recommended for adolescents who weigh at least 35 kilos. That's not yet adopted in the guidelines, um, but even if you go to the CDC website, there's, there's intent with the next update that that will be um, in place as well. So, um, you know, generally speaking, this is a once daily regimen. There have been a few studies, so there were two French studies um, that kind of supported this concept of what we call on-demand PrEP. Um, and so this is more for individuals who are at, a, at a, like a seasonal risk, um, is how I consider it. So rather than just taking daily PrEP, if they feel like they're gonna be at a higher risk of um, HIV, let's say they're going on vacation and they're gonna get wild that weekend or whatever, um, they take two Truvada tablets um, two to 24 hours before intercourse. They take another tablet 24 hours after and then a third dose 24 hours after that. Um, and so 
the French studies actually showed, you know, this was, uh, there was not any higher risk of HIV acquisition with this means. Um, it's not recommended per CDC or FDA. Society of USA and the WHO also, um, they do endorse this as an optional recommendation, but only in men who have sex with men who do not have frequent um, sexual intercourse. And um, Kaiser, I believe, came out with a study, um, or kind of pending a study in um, the U.S. in San Francisco that was just released like June of 2020, so really very recently, that followed um, over 200 male um, individuals, so men who have sex with men. I don't believe that they followed any trans women. Um, there were no female patients. Um, they also have data to support that on-demand prep as a potential alternative option. Um, I've discussed this with very few patients, um, and it's again, it's based on risk, but uh, not using this means still really uh, daily prep use is the only one that's recommended. Next slide. Hey, Kaylee, can I interrupt you on that slide? Yeah, yeah sure, please. It's such an interesting statement. Um, adult persons who inject drugs who are at substantial risk of HIV acquisition. So I guess um, we would be asking people about needle sharing and hoping that people are um, being straightforward about the risk of needle sharing. Is that how you interpret that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll tell you um, just, you know, my discussions I have with my patients that inject, um, and a lot of it is, is really just trying to establish an open discussion with them and let them know that, you know, And so I'm really just trying to make sure that they're being responsible about their practices. If you have a um, patient that injects that's not, doesn't have access to a needle exchange, so we don't have very many syringe exchange programs in West Virginia. Um, if they do have access to a syringe exchange um, and they're using that regularly, they're not sharing or dispensing those works with anyone else, then PrEP's really not going to be something um, necessarily that's going to change their risk of HIV. Um, but again, we don't don't tend to have that option in, in most places. So um, that's kind of where, where I see it coming into play. I, I kind of leave it on the patients a lot of times. Um, you know, do they feel like they're at a higher risk and do they feel like they would benefit from PrEP? And that kind of opens the door to have some more honest discussions with patients. Um, they appreciate it when you're not shoving it under the door, kind of what they're doing, and you're interested in, in how they can be healthier and be more responsible. Um, a lot of times, not all the time, but that's, that's kind of my approach, is if they're, if they're um, engaged in other services, especially, you know, in West Virginia, um, and they're using those and not, not sharing any works, then um, don't have any sexual risk. Um, PrEP may, may or may not be something that they want to consider, but it's kind of an adjunct if they're interested. Um, so PrEP efficacy has been evaluated in several clinical trials. Um, these are lists of most of them, and I try to divide them up into um, risk factors. Uh, men and women, persons who inject drugs. Uh, we'll talk about them, a few of them in more detail in the next slide if you want to advance that, please. Okay, so um, Basically, what all the data shows is that PrEP works, um, but really the drug levels correlate with a protective effect. So the Partners PrEP, uh, prep trial that really um, looked at heterosexual men and women um, showed that overall those individuals that used, and this was tenofovir, um, disaproxyl, and emtricitabine, showed overall a 75 HIV, uh, percent overall HIV risk reduction, um, which is not bad, it's better than 0%, but whenever they measured detectable um, serum drug levels, they noted that there was actually a 90% risk reduction. Um, similar with the IPREX trial that followed um, MSM, it was 44% overall reduction in HIV incidence, but um, that increased to a 92% reduction in patients with detectable drug levels. So the thing to note is that, you know, if they were taking it, it worked. But um, a lot of patients in these trials weren't necessarily taking the medication um, as it was directed. Now, the Bangkok-Tanafavir study um, was the 
the big one that they did with the injection drug use population. Um, the data here is not as robust. It showed about a 45% overall risk reduction um, in those that had detectable drug levels up to a Not, um, not as robust as reducing um, transmission with injection drug use versus um, sexual transmission risk. But a couple things I want to point out is that, um, you know, the one thing is this was only studying tenofovir. It was not studying tenofovir and tricitabine. And so that may have influenced it as well. Um, also, you know, we, we don't really know if the, um, it, takes a, it takes a while longer for tenofovir levels to show up in serum um, than it does in rectal and, or, and vaginal tissue. It's about the same. So, um, you know, that may have been something to consider as well as these patients might not have been on PrEP long enough. So a couple things to consider, but the data is not as great um, with patients using PrEP being protective um, if risk is injection drug use. So the STRAND trial, um, which was actually kind of a subset of the IPREX trial, this only followed a subset of, um, it was MSM. And what they did was um, they kind of looked back at the concentrations um, and correlated those to risk reduction and so, and um, with adherence. And so of those MSM that were taking Truvada uh, seven doses every week, it was a 99% risk reduction even if they only took two doses a week, so poor adherence, um, it was still a 76% risk reduction. So the this matters, it correlates with a protective effect. With MSM, there's a little bit more forgiveness. Now with females, um, there've been some lab studies that have shown uh, PrEP levels in rectal and vaginal tissue um, is much different. And so for females, really, they have to be taking um, at least six to seven doses to even get like an 86% protective effect. So unfortunately, um, in females, there's, there's not as much forgiveness if they miss doses. Next slide. And you can advance because we'll talk about kind of how we pr prescribe it now. Um, so we need to assess the risk of HIV acquisition. Um, we already kind of talked about this on, on prior slides, but basically um, have open discussions with your patients about sex and about risk behaviors, which I feel like all of you guys already do this because you've been doing Hep C and you guys are so awesome at asking these questions anyway. But um, really, you know, when you're having these conversations about sexual behavior and sexual activity, if you've had anybody that's uh, been diagnosed with an STI in the past six months, um, pregnant females, you know, assess not just are they sexually active, but, uh, you know, are these individuals, what kind of behaviors do they engage in? Um, assess your patients for alcohol use, especially before sexual activity. Same thing with drug use, because, um, you know, riskier behaviors kind of can occur in certain instances under the influence. Um, consider the likelihood that a sex. There's been a lot of data. If you want to Google the U equals U campaign, um, that having an HIV positive partner that's undetectable, so on treatment and undetectable for at least six months, they're really not putting you at any risk for transmitting HIV. So. The U equals U uh, campaign stands for undetectable equals untransmissible. And so if you have a patient that has an HIV positive partner, you can certainly discuss PrEP, but it's really more important for you to discuss with them what their partner's um, HIV status is. So are they on treatment? Are they adherent with their treatment? Um, are they your only partner? Are you their only partner? How long have they been undetectable? So get further details whether than just whether or not the partner has HIV, because they may not benefit from PrEP. Um, you could still consider it, but they may not um, reap a huge benefit from PrEP. And then the last thing is also, if you have anybody that's um, coming into your clinic that was prescribed post-exposure prophylaxis, um, you may want to consider just transitioning them to PrEP if they have an ongoing risk. Next slide. So the three things you need to know, or a couple things that you need to know um, before you prescribe PrEP, 
They need to have a documented HIV negative uh, antibody test within a week of initiating PrEP. Ideally, this is the fourth generation combining a general antibody. Um, make sure that they don't have any signs or symptoms of acute HIV infection on the day. Um, they need to have a normal creatinine clearance, so greater than 60 if you plan to use Truvada, greater than 30 if you choose um, Descovy. And then make sure their um, hepatitis B status is documented. Vaccine them if they're susceptible. Um, caution if they uh, have active hepatitis B. B, so surface antigen positive. And the concept here is that the tenofovir component of PrEP actually treats hepatitis B. So this is kind of similar to when we talk about, um, you know, uh, hepatitis C and he causing hep B flares when you treat it. If you have somebody that's on Truvada or Descovy um, for PrEP and they have hepatitis B, the danger is not when you have them on it, it's when they come off of it, they can have a flare. Uh, next slide. So other um, considerations, make sure the patient's really, you know, willing to commit to taking this every day. Um, guidelines state, you know, you really need to have follow-up um, HIV testing performed at least every three months. My practice is, is that I'll write for them to have their initial PrEP prescription. Um, I let them know, you know, I initially like to see them every three months. If they've been in care for a while, I might not need the, to see them uh, in person as frequently, but they need to have um, their lab work done at least every three months and they need to allow it enough time that I'll have the results so I can send a refill. If I don't have an HIV test every three months, I'm not going to refill it for them until um, I can document that I'm not start or not continuing PrEP when they actually have HIV infection. Screen every three months. Um, baseline STD screening, and then at least every three to six months, again, based on their risks. Three-site testing, um, this is, it, it's kind of hard to get these swabs, so this would be a, a urine, gonorrhea, and chlamydia test. Um, you could also do the urethral or the vaginal swab, but it's one of those sites, and then oropharyngeal, as well as a rectal um, swab, that's three-site testing. Um, sometimes one site may turn positive when the other who don't. So you really need to um, test all sites that are at risk for um, STI acquisition. And then um, self-collected samples, just to comment about those. Um, a lot of times patients may not be comfortable having someone do a rectal swab. So um, there's been some data that suggests, you know, self-collected samples are just as good as if the provider collects them. So I usually give the patients the option um, if they want to collect them themselves or if they want me to perform the test. And then um, annual hepatitis C screening for your MSM and uh, persons who inject drugs. And that's uh, typically annually, maybe more frequently based on risk. And then um, counsel on condom use, counsel on harm reduction practices, syringe exchange, et cetera. Next slide. Um, now, PrEP is not approved for pregnant women. Um, so for women that are on PrEP, make sure that they're uh, screening for pregnancy and on contraception. Um, this is for those who don't wish to. It has an HIV positive partner. They are wishing to become pregnant um, and you're considering PrEP as a risk reduction. That's going to be an individual um, case by case discussion. Um, counseling on side effects and, and understandings. We talked about the renal potential um, toxicity. It's really Fanconi's, which is very rare, but can occur. Um, side effects, I discuss this as kind of a startup syndrome. So usually within the first um, few weeks, may last up to uh, the first month. People can get tired, appetite loss, GI effects, headaches. That will go away. It doesn't last forever. So if they do get that, just tell them to stick through it. Um, it's while their body's getting accustomed to the medication, uh, but it, it does go away usually within the first few weeks to a month, um, typically not any longer than three months. Those side effects would go away. And then one small comment about uh, side effects long-term toxicities of changes in bone mineral density. Um, this is very small in non-infected, HIV-infected individuals. 
um, about one to two percent loss and is reversible. So whenever they stop prep, um, that improved back to their baseline. There weren't any fractures seen in the prep trials. Now, the SCOVI um, and HIV infected individuals, there is better bone protection. studied yet in uh, PrEP patients, but um, it's such a very small proportion regardless. So unless they have a history of osteopenia, osteoporosis, pathologic fractures, um, there's not any kind of routine monitoring you would do for this. Immunizations, make sure they're vaccinated appropriately, Hep A, B, tetanus, uh, HPV, et cetera. Drug interactions, um, tenofovir can occasionally interact with them hepatitis C drugs. And then the last thing to know is that discontinuation is expected. So this is a preventative medication, just again, like birth control. So it's to be expected whenever um, that outcome is, is no longer wanted. So if they're, they change their behaviors, they're not um, at a higher risk of HIV infection, this person is not expected to be on PrEP for the rest of their life. Next slide. Um, I put a table in just because uh, I never have this memorized, but this is our Hep C agents. Um, the last two rows are our two uh, PrEP medications. So tenofovir disaproxyl is the formulation that comprises um, Truvada. Tenofovir alafanamide is the formulation that comprises Descovy. And so you can see with um, Descovy, there's not any interaction with Truvada, um, you need to consider the tenoff of your levels may be increased if you're using Harvoni, if you're using um, Vosevi, and so there's a higher risk of um, renal toxicity. And so you would not want to use this medication, particularly in these combinations, if their or creatinine clearance is less than 60. Next slide. And then this is just, um, I just tell you, print this off. This is just a summary of basically everything I went over. Um, so this is your good guidance as far as how to determine if their risk factor, factor indicates um, that they should have PrEP, um, how to determine if they're clinically eligible, the prescription. Now, this is a little outdated, so it doesn't have Discovy on it. Um, and then kind of what else you need to do for them to be maintained on PrEP. Next slide. Um, there have been case reports of PrEP failure. So again, um, this is HIV acquisition despite good adherence to the medication. And so all you need to remember here is it's very rare for this to, I mean, this is like less than 1%. Um, PrEP is not 100% effective. And you need to tell that patient up right up front because they may have this concept in their head that they're going to just be safe from everything if they're on PrEP. It does not protect against other STIs. Um, it does not protect against pregnancy. It's not 100% effective against HIV. So it's kind of one portion of um, HIV prevention. And then I have a couple more slides left and these are more related to, related to like billing and coding. Um, so, this is another printout I would have because one thing that um, we kind of ran into when I first started prescribing PrEP was um, insurance paying for it. Most insurances do pay for at least some co-formulation, whether it be Truvada or Discovy, most insurances do cover it now. Sometimes the patient still has a high copay. Um, so this is just kind of an algorithm to go through to help you um, offset the cost to the patient. So if they have insurance, if you look under number one, um, if they have a private insurance, so not Medicaid, not Medicare, they can apply for the Gilead who manufactures both Truvada and Discovy. They can apply for that copay card. Same thing if they're uninsured, they can apply for that copay card. Um, number two and three are more so um, for patients that have Medicare. Um, the Patient Advocate Foundation is for insured. It's not just for Medicare, but they are often out of funds. And then if they're not insured, there's to the right column, there's some um, assistance on, on how to get patients approved for PrEP. 
Next slide. Um, one option if the patient does not have prescription drug coverage, regardless if they have Medicare but no Part D, if they don't have um, any insurance, et cetera, there is a new program um, that just started in the fall uh, called Ready, Set, Prep. There's no income-related eligibility. participating pharmacy and that's the website um, there's also a provider resource if you need help with that but that's someone that does not have prescription drug coverage um, they will pay for the medication next slide so even though there's some assistance programs to help offset the cost of medication and so on average about a year supply of prep cash price is about twenty six thousand um, dollars so even if you get all the medication covered just still understand you need to um, consider the costs of labs and visits. If you work for an F, uh, QHC, should have some assistance there. Um, if patient can't come and see me, sometimes I have it in coordinates like with the health department or their primary care that the labs may be at less cost to them. So they just get them there and then have the results faxed to me. But basically I put down, you know, their initial visit, then three month visit, six month visit, nine month visit, 12. Um, and then how estimate, so in a year's time, they'll have accrued the cost of five, at least five HIV tests, typically three creatinine tests, typically three STD screens, annual HCV screen, maybe pregnancy, hep B screen, vaccines, STI treatments if that comes up, and then as needed lab. So there's still a substantial cost to the patient even if the medication is covered, and that needs to be discussed openly with them as well. Next slide. So PrEP billing codes, again, this is, um, you know, more so just for, for you guys when you're starting to prescribe, um, just billing and coding. I don't really need to go. And next slide. And then conclusion, just know PrEP is one component of the HIV preventative care continu continuum. It's uh, generally pretty well tolerated, but there's some important toxicities of uncertain long-term importance, um, particularly renal toxicity, some bone toxicity. Um, PrEP should be considered for anyone who's at higher risk of HIV acquisition. And there's greater than 90% reduction in HIV risk with good adherence, taking once daily dosing. And I think that's it. I think the next slide is just references for you guys. Thank you so much, Kaylee. That was excellent. Um, super informative. Um, we got a chat in thanking you as well. I know we are at the end of our session time, but I wanted to ask, were there any questions for Kaylee? No, no questions. Hey, this is John. Hey, Kaylee, thank you. Um, I want to steal that PowerPoint. That was beautiful. Um, can, can I, and your, your audio was cutting, cutting in and out on mine. I apologize. Did, um, was there, um, did, did, uh, would you mind if I mentioned cabotegravir? Go for it. I didn't mention that. Okay. So um, Kaylee hit the nail on the head and, um, you know, adherence is literally everything with PrEP. And the, the initial, like, New England Journal article that came out that kind of made PrEP not look that awesome that Kaylee talks about, obviously, was because people didn't do uh, um, great adherence. But so the next step in this is how do we get away from having to take a pill every day? And there's a, in July 7th, there's a, a, a trial result came out for cabotegravir, one of the integrase inhibitors that we don't currently have access to for anything else. Um, but uh, it's an injection once every eight weeks, and it, different, and it, and it demonstrated superiority to um, taking PrEP. And in this trial, people actually took PrEP pretty well, like 87% or something like that. So they actually were adherent. But even with good adherence, the injection uh, demonstrated, I'm going to read the results, um, an incidence rate of HIV seroconversion of 0.4% versus 1.2%. So that's right along with what we quote. We quote 99% efficacy with Truvada and Descovy in general. And, and this, so this would be half a percentage. The cabotegravir was even more impressive. So anyway, it's on the radar, it's not available, but coming soon potentially to a uh, FDA approval um, near you or something like that, so. Thank you, Dr. Davis. 
All right, any final thoughts or comments? Um, feel free to email me as well if you think of any after the fact. Um, so I have just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Our next session will be on August 13th and uh, Judith Feinberg is providing the didactic on extrahepatic manifestation. So keep an eye out for that reminder. Um, thank you to, I think Dr. Rexford had to hop off uh, to see a patient, but thank you to her. Thank you, Dr. Peters for your case as well. And big thanks to Kaylee for that excellent didactic. We'll see you guys next time.